Don't limit God to the ability of your thinking. You see, God can do so much more than what we can possibly perceive. But if we, if we simply think that God can only do what I can do, then we think God is useless. Because without God, I can do nothing. But with God, I can be limitless. You don't want to hear the word of God. So it's great to see God work on you guys as he is the potter. We are the clay. Uh, so today's title is simply, We Are His Clay. And uh, uh, it's been awesome studying the book of Jeremiah. It's super hard line. They just, and, and we just got to realize that the book of Jeremiah, although we read it chapter to chapter, when it was happening, it, it wasn't back to back to them. This is a span of over about 50 to 60 years. So when you're reading in between chapters, God may feel like he's kind of correcting them all the time, but he's actually letting time for them to repent before coming back again. It's like, man, y'all ain't repented yet. And God gave them 52 chapters, amen. That means that God gave them years to repent. And in, in some of these chapters, we're going to learn that God even gave them generations to repent. That would be like if you didn't repent, and then your children didn't repent, and their children's children didn't repent, and their children's 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 children didn't repent. God is like, I've been so patient with you guys, but my patience has a limit. And, and we got to realize that the Old Testament is a spiritual reality to us, meaning that for them, the learning was very physical. It, it was so direct and discipling was so physical, but to us, it's a spiritual reality. Meaning that when we read these chapters about God's judgment, we got to apply it to our lives in the spiritual sense. Uh, because God is a lot more faster at giving judgment nowadays than the Old Testament, amen? So chapter 16, because you don't want to hear the word of God. You guys fired up? You guys want to get into God's word? When we read this book, don't take it personal with me. I'm just a messenger, man. If you got a problem, go take it up to God. Go tell God how you feel. I'm just a messenger, family. I'm just trying to read the Bible and trying to do it too, amen. Chapter 16, verse 1. The word of the Lord came to me. You must not marry and have sons or daughters in this place. And the church said, Amen. you may be seated. What a passage. Jeremiah is literally being commanded not to marry. Now, this is very unusual for God to tell this to a prophet because, as we know, the apostles, were most of them got married. Peter was married. He had a wife, a man. Now, most of them actually had wives in the Old Testament, but Jeremiah was one of the few that was actually told not to marry in this place. Wow. In the biblical Hebrew, there's not even a word for the word bachelor. Can you believe that? In the Bible, it's like there's no bachelors. Everybody was married in the Old Testament. Everybody had a conviction about marriage. No one was sleeping around, hiding out of adultery, sleeping and, and living with someone who you're not married. No one did that in the Old Testament. People had conviction. To them, their norm is like, I got to get married. And a lot of the times, they were even had arranged marriages between families, so the children will have a wife very early age. Uh, in the Hispanic culture, people who were getting married is about 60 years back, they were getting married when they were like 15. It was the culture. People were just married. No one like lived out of, no one was going around and sleeping around. That, that's just not what the scriptures teach. So for him not to be married was a huge deal. And the question you got to ask is, why is God commanding Jeremiah to celibacy? Why is God telling him, no, don't get married? Verse 3, for this is what the Lord says about the sons and daughters born in the, this land. And about the women who are their mothers and the men who are their fathers. They will die of deadly diseases. They will be they will not be mourned or buried, but will be like a dung laying on the ground. They will perish by the sword and famine, and their dead bodies will become food for the birds and the wild animals. And the church said, 
you can see why God says, it's probably not good for you to have children. It's probably good for you not to have a wife because everybody in this land is going to die. I'm going to humiliate these people. So Jeremiah, you just got to stay single for a little bit, amen? You got to be the first bachelor, amen? You ain't getting married. So God was kind of protecting Jeremiah from his children inheriting such a punishment. And a lot of us can tend to complain a little bit when we're single a little bit too long in our eyes. Talk to Jeremiah. Ultimately, your life is in God's plans. Your life is in God's hands. He decides when you're ready to get married. He decides when you got to take the next step. He decides. He makes it happen. You just got to get out of the way. So if you think you're waiting too long, talk to Jeremiah in your prayers. Be like, God, let me just learn from Jeremiah. I mean, he was single. He was preaching the word. He was uh, arrested. He was beat. He was all this thing. He didn't have a boot. Someone to talk to to get home. He just had God. But y'all don't want to hear the word of God, man. Chapter 16, verse 4. I got a lot to get through, but you you, you guys just got to keep up with me, man. Jeremiah, uh, God tells them, they will die of deadly diseases. They will not be mourned or buried, but will be like the dung lying on the ground. They will perish by the sword and famine, and their dead bodies will become food for the birds and the wild animals. For this is what the Lord says, do not enter a house where there is a funeral meal. Do not go mourn or show sympathy, because I have withdrawn my blessing. My love, my pity from these people declares the Lord. Family, this is a scary passage. You get to a point spiritually so bad that God needs to say, I have taken everything away from you. I have withdrawn my blessing. I have withdrawn my love, my pity. You have nothing. Can you imagine getting to the point spiritually where God says, you know what? You have nothing from me. And when you die, no one's even going to mourn you. No one's going to go show up and cry for you. You're just going to be laying on the ground and the birds are going to eat you up. God's got protection. God ain't playing no games with us. God says, I'm not going to show up to your funeral. God is like, no one's going to cry for you. No one's going to mourn you. God is like, I'm not going to be there. You know, and, and this is so impactful because even in families, when you're going to get along with someone, you at least have the common respect to show up for, to give your sympathy, correct? God says, no one's going to do that. And I'm not going to be present. I mean, family, you got to build some convictions. When, when you don't repent, God says, you're going to die physically and spiritually. I'm not going to be present. You're going to be eaten up by your own sin, by the birds that you so fed, and they're going to eat you up. And I'm not even going to look. I'm not, I have withdrawn everything from you. That's a scary thought. That you can get to a point spiritually where God just literally says, you have nothing from me. What a passage. But you only want to hear the word of God. Are you guys with me, church? So verse 12. But you have behaved more wickedly than your ancestors. See how all of you are following the stubbornness of your evil hearts instead of obeying me. You see, God was bringing judgment because the generations weren't repenting. They were becoming even more wicked. Now, it only takes one person to break the chains out of the family and a lot of us in this room you have that opportunity to be the chain that breaks the chain you get to start a new path with God I know where I come from I know my family I know my traditions I know the expectations they had on me and I know the man that came before me and I had to say you know what enough is enough Although I don't have a good example in my family of what was a godly man, a man that was faithful to his wife, a man that respected his children, a man that loved his children, a man that worked by the work of his hands. I don't got none of that. I had to decide. I got to look at Jesus' example. 
And a lot of us put up way too many excuses. I don't have a good example in my life. Yes, you do. You got Jesus. Last time I checked, he is the greatest example of what a man looks like in this life. And I had to make that decision. I'm, I can't look at my past, at my, at my genealogy, and say, man, that was a good example. I can't do that. It's lost. I have to start something new with God. Are you excited to start something new with Jesus? That someone can look at Maurice and say, man, look at your descendancy. You created a lineage of disciples. You may not have much in this life. You may not be known by many people in this life, but God knows your name. And when you die, God is present that day. Who do you want there to be at your funeral? Your family, that's, that, you know, that's good. But is God going to be present when you die? Is God going to be looking at you when you die and say, come home, my son? Or will, that, will you be just laying on the ground like the Bible said, and you're just going to be eaten up by the birds? And God says, who was that? That was literally his heart. God's just like, I, I have nothing with this person. He, he completely ignored me in every way. I'm going to do the same. God's got conviction, family. And when we come together as, as a church, as a family, we become the collective body of Christ. All of us have a different perspective. All of us have a different gift from God. And when we come together, we become his body. So God loves his body. God loves all of you guys. You see, you are perfectly made in God's eyes. You are his clay that he's working on. And we're going to read in Jeremiah why this is so important. Now, chapter 16, verse 17, it, it, I, I, we got to build a conviction on this. In, in verse 17, man, I just get fired up when I preach the word. Verse 17, the Bible says, my eyes are on all their ways. They are not hidden from me. Nor is their sin concealed from my eyes. And I think we all just got to build a conviction that God's eyes are all over the place. And we see it all throughout Jeremiah. I mean, it's, it's so evident that you cannot hide from God. But why do we do it? Why do you have a hidden life when you claim to be something you're not? Why are you trying to hide from God? You just can't do it. God says, I know your ways. They're not hidden from me. No, is your sin concealed from my eyes. We got to build a conviction. There's nothing you can hide. If you're not going to be genuine, just be honest. And at least don't pretend to be a disciple. I mean, come on, guys. We got to build a conviction here. It's best to be honest. None of us are perfect. But this is what confession purifies us. Because God, like we talk, God is not looking for someone perfect, but God is looking for you to find his affection. That when you look for God's affection, you get closer to God. You are honest with God. You're honest with yourself. You're honest with the people in your life. And God says, that is my affection that makes him perfection. You know, God, God, you know, you act differently when someone's looking at you. Let's be honest, amen? This is not, you know, uh, we have the privilege of hosting my mother-in-law at my house. Now, I know that she's always around, so I act differently, you know? You know, I, I just, I can't walk around the, the house with no shirt on, you know? I can't, because I know that my mother-in-law is in the apartment, amen? We got to act that way with God. When you get into your room, you got to realize that God is right there next to you. You want to know how close God is with you? He says, I have my spirit in you. God is like, God is so close to you. He's in you. So God is right next to you when you decide to be wicked. You know, you wouldn't do that in front. I wouldn't do nothing in front of my mother. Like, why would I do it in front of God? And, and if we do that, it's because we don't really see God as a living God. God is only the living God when I'm a church. That's when I'm going to be my best. That's when my con is going to be the best. That's when I'm, I'm not saying inappropriate things. But when God is not around, I'm going to do me. God says, I don't know what you're talking about, but you're not hidden from me. I see everything. Now, what's scary as we learn is that when your sin gets so bad, 
God will literally hide you from him. Yeah. And once God does that, it's hard to get back on his good side of it. Yeah. So it's a good thing that God is watching. It's a good God that God is giving you accountable. God is keeping you in his eyes. Amen. Yeah. Man, you're getting too quiet for me now. <laughs> you don't like the Bible? You don't like being called out, called higher? I'm not here to make you feel good. Amen. If, if that's what you're looking for, this church isn't for you. I'm here to call you to the standard of the Bible, whether that makes you feel good or makes you feel bad or makes you feel something else. I don't know. You just go pray about it, and God will make it clear to you. Now, chapter 16, verse 20. Do people make their own gods? Yes, but they're not gods. Therefore, I will teach them. This time, I will teach them my power and might. Then they will know that my name is the Lord in the church set. Can I talk about the Mexican culture a little bit? You know, in the, in the Mexican culture, there's just some things you just, just, you just don't say. You know, growing up in Mexico, if you talk about anyone's mama, I mean, that was fighting words. He's like, you're trying to fight. So where I come from, if you talk about my mama, that means you're trying to fight. So no one talked about each other's mom until you were ready to fight. Now, I had a little bit of a culture shock when I moved to the United States. Because in high school and middle school, people were talking about mamas all the time. I was like, hold me back. It's like, I was, I was ready to fight everybody. And then someone pulled me to the side. It's like, why are you getting so mad? He's like, he just talked about my mom. He's like, he made a joke about your mom. And I was like, I don't like that. But... I had to realize that there was a culture shock. But some of us need to have a godly culture shock. Why? You got to realize that your own life in the world, there is a culture shock in the kingdom of God. Because we don't practice what the world does. We don't, do, we don't do what the world does. We don't say or do what they do. We honor God's name. And if his name is not honored, he literally says, I will teach you my power of my name so what area of your life are you challenging god's name what area are you really challenging god for him to prove to you and get to the point where else where god says man i'm gonna teach this person that this is my name which is the lord a little bit of a culture shock with god disciples you amen God's name is Lord. So why is God's name Lord? Because, you see, Lord points towards his character. God isn't physical. Now, he had to send Jesus so we can relate to a physical form. But God isn't physical. God is more of, it's hard to define what he is, but he's kind of like characteristics. Right? God is patient. God is kind. Those are things that point towards him. And God knows everything. A lot of us got to stop looking at Jesus like your savior, but as your master. You see, you got to obey Jesus. And people don't like that. They don't like to obey because you either come from a past where your parents were harsh on you. And now you have a little bit of a rebellious heart. And now you don't really want to obey Jesus. But Jesus says, I am Lord. And if you don't understand this, you're going to have a culture shock where I'm going to make my power known through your example. You don't want to be like the Israelites where God says, man, they're not listening. They're not not obeying my word. I gave them all the opportunities to repent, but they will know who my name is. You know, if you obey someone, it shows how much you think they know what's best for you. It shows how much you really trust in that person. Right? You don't obey someone you don't trust. Because you know that, you know, I can't trust this person because he's going to hurt me down the line. But with God, you got to trust him. You got to take yourself out of the way. That's hard. Is it not? Especially when we come from broken homes. I come from a broken home. You know, I I didn't know what it it meant to rely on a father for, for him to give to me, for him to provide for me. I didn't have that. I had to start working. I was like 16, 17. So I can buy things that I wanted. So I I was just trying to get, I'm like, I can't trust. It's hard for me, but I had to learn that Jesus is Lord. I got to trust God. 
Can I keep on preaching a little bit? I got time. Jeremiah 17, verse 5. We got to get to some of these chapters. We got, we got 52 chapters. We got to get to some of these, man. Verse 5 says, this is what the Lord says. Curse is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. And the church said, Amen. you know, what makes it dangerous to trust in a man is that you derive strength from the flesh. Yeah. And in doing so, the scripture says a very interesting connection is that in doing so, your heart departs from God. You can't trust in man and trust in God at the same time because your heart is leaning to what you trust. So Jeremiah here, God is saying, when you trust in man, you're actually taking out your heart and putting them in them. And God says, you can't do that. You're departing from me. You got to trust your heart's got to be mine. We got to build a conviction about this family. Now, can I keep on preaching? Man, y'all too quiet for me. I, I, don't, I don't like that. I don't know if you're getting convicted or what's going on. I like being preached back to, amen? Verse 6 says, that person will be like a bush in the wasteland. They will not see pro prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert, in a salt land where no one lives. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, who confines in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water, sands out of its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruits. You guys love the Bible? Now, when I study this out, it's actually a reference about a cursed tree in Israel. Some believe that it was actually, it went extinct when they were conquered because they burned all the trees. And this cursed tree was a very healthy and abundant tree that survived even in hard times. It had always green leaves. It was always bearing fruit. It was always planted. So this is a beautiful image of what your heart should look like. What do we learn? Your heart should be planted deeply in the heart of God. You see, when a tree is planted by a river, its roots grow to the bottom and then they extend towards the river. So it's always having nourishment. It is never dry. It has deeply rooted roots. Where is your heart this morning? When troubles come your way, do your leaves get a little dry? Do they start falling off the tree? Do they get a little brown and a little yellow and then they just get all dry and fall off the tree? What kind of, what kind of leaves you got this morning? Or are you deeply rooted in God where trouble comes your way and, and you have a constant flow of God's love? You got, you know what? I don't know how you're going to do this, but I know you got my back. And you're always green. You're by the stream that is abundant and always flowing. God ain't no little river. God ain't no Chicago river. You don't see those rivers here in Chicago. They're all muddy and, and barely moving, nasty. I mean, go ahead, go swim in that river. You know, I never, I never got, I got to my prayer spots and I see those, you know, those, those, those murky water rivers. So I never say, I want to go swim there. Nah, I'm good. But some of us do that spiritually. We swim in those waters, muddy waters, nasty waters. You get in there and you're all comfortable. Then you come out, you got mud everywhere. You got raggedy leaves. That's how you look spiritually. When your heart is not deeply rooted in God. What you looking like this morning? How, how you looking at? How, when God looks at you, what does he see? Does he see a nice green tree planted by his heart? Or where you planted at? You planted in hope deferred? Oh, I didn't get what I wanted this year, so I'm not, I'm not, I'm not green spiritually. I mean, come on, family. Can, can, we, not, can we not be green all year round? We got to, amen, Bonita? All right, I'll keep going, amen. Jeremiah 17, verse 9. Now, I, I love this path. I got to say, I, I love this verse here. It says, the heart is deceitful above all things 
and beyond cure. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. You know, when I read this passage, I got to be honest. You know, when I have my quiet time, I don't, you know, I'm a man. I'm a little selfish. I got to be honest. I just like to, you know, keep my quiet time. But I, I got to share this with my wife. Like, this is awesome. I got fired up. I came out of my prayer spot. He's like, you can't believe what I just learned. You know, the Bible is completely opposite from the world. What does the world say? Follow your heart. What is your heart telling you to do? Go ahead and follow that. But the Bible says, don't follow your hearts. It's beyond cure. It says that your heart is deceitful. You know, hey, that's, the world says, if it feels good for me, then I'll do it. The world says, you know, if it smells, looks right for me, then I'll do it. You know, that is the ideology that got the Israelites harshly judged. They just follow their hearts. They follow their passions. They trusted in man. And their heart became deceitful because they trusted themselves. When you follow your heart, it's, it's a self-worship. Why? Because your heart is deceitful. Don't follow your heart. When you follow your heart, you're following yourself. And that is very dangerous. Anyone in this room, can you say you're perfect? If you're perfect, why are you following your heart? If you're imperfect, why are you following your heart? You know, in the Mexican culture, I find it so fascinating. We come to this, the United States with nothing, and our heart inclination is to have everything. You came from nothing, I had nothing, I want everything! And it consumes people. I see it in my family. I see it in Hispanic people. They're consumed by the American dream. It's like, man, if I just have all these things I want, then I'll be happy. And God says, when you die and you have all the things you want and when you achieve everything, then God says, I don't even know who you are. You are consumed by self. And I'm not saying don't work hard. Believe me, you should work hard. But that shouldn't be who you are. That, hey, come on. You cannot follow your deceitful hearts. Yeah. You know, a, a lot of the Israelites, even if you look at Joshua, and he was rebelled with one of the family members, he followed his heart. You guys know what I'm talking about? His whole tent was burned out, the whole open, the ground opened up. Huh? Yes, Achan. He followed his heart. He's like, man, everyone can be a leader. Everyone can do this. Well, it's not just you, Moses. So he followed his evil heart, and God says, I'm going to open up the ground for you. I got a special place. I got a special place for you where I'm not going to remember you down there. And, and the Bible says, search the heart and I test the mind. God says, I, I, I'm the one that looks into your heart, and when difficulty comes your way, I'm dissecting your heart. I'm looking at your heart, and you see what you're thinking. You see, God's looking at your conduct, and he's judging you based on it. Why? Because it exposes your heart. Yeah, that's right. You know, a lot of the times, we don't like to be judged by what we do. Yeah. But the Bible is very clear that you will be judged by what you do. God says, if you, if you're, you're, usually your conduct is a direct reflection of what you're thinking in your heart. Yeah. If you don't like commitment to God, you don't come to church. Why? That's a thought in your heart. It's a conduct. And God says, I'm judging you based on that. Yeah. Because it's commonly deeply rooted from your hearts. That's just, can we not get behind God's plan? Y'all yeah. yeah. just getting quiet in the back. I mean, y'all getting convicted. I don't know what's going on back there. But Chiago's fired up, man. All right, let's keep reading. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. Jeremiah 18, verse 1 through 6. What time is it? Okay, I got a little bit of time. This is what the Lord that came to Jeremiah from the Lord said. Verse 2, go down to the potter's house, and there I will give you my message. So I went down to the potter's house, and I saw him working at the wheel. But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, 
shaping it as it seemed best to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me. He said, can I not do this with you, Israel, as this potter does, declares the Lord, like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand, Chicago church. Oh, baby. You know, the, the problem with the clay is that it failed to reflect God's heart. And when God was working on them in their hearts and in their life, they didn't mold to God. They molded to themselves. And I came to a conviction. You know, there's a story that I've been told, and I think I should share it with you guys, that there was a potter work. But he says, you know what? I want to work on, uh, 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 what is the specific? I want to work on Marvel. And he goes to this palace and says, hey, we got a job for you. We want you to work on this beautiful ground and, and put this sign all over it. And in the center, there will be a statue. Once you're done with the ground, then work on the statue. They will both be made out of marble. So the worker gets his, you know, his chisels and he starts working on the ground. He starts hitting it. And as he began to hit the ground, the ground spoke to him. And he said, what are you doing? He's like, I, I, I'm shaping you. I'm working in you. I'm making you beautiful. So people from all over the world can come and admire who you are. And, and the ground said, but it, 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 it hurts too much. I don't like it. But the worker kept working on the ground, and the ground kept complaining, kept talking back. And, and eventually the worker said, let it be so. I will no longer work on you. You will be simply simple. And, and the worker Focus on the statue. And as he began to hit the statue and began to make new markings on it and began to put all his strength into it, the statue welcomed the pain. It, it, it let the worker work on it. Even though it hurts, it responded with gratitude. He said, I know it hurts, but I will be beautiful. He welcomed the pain. He welcomed the struggle. He welcomed it. And then at the end of the statue's process, it was beautiful. From all over the world, people would come and worship the statue. We were like, wow, it's so beautiful. Not worship, admire, correct, correction. And as they came and admired the statue, everyone would step over the floor. Because it was just a regular floor. And, and the floor talked to the statue, why, why does everyone step on me? But everyone come from every corner of the earth just to look at you. And the statue said, because I never complained. When, when, when the worker was working on me, I simply welcomed it as a blessing. But you complain every, every time the chisel hit you. You complain every time things got hard. You complain and you wrestled and you fought back the worker so he ignored you. And because you didn't let the master work in you, everyone steps on you. Who are you this morning? In God's creation, are you the marble that he complains? Are you the pot that is complaining, moving, shaping your own way? Or are you the statue that you're letting God work in your hearts? You're letting God mold you into something beautiful. Yeah. Even though it hurts. Even though it's painful. You're called to grow. You don't like it. But God says, because he lets me work on him, he will be beautiful. Will everyone step on your legacy or they will look at your legacy? We're building something deeper than ourselves, family. We're building a new generation of disciples. And although it hurts when God works in you, we just got to welcome in God. Go ahead. Keep going. You took everything from me, God, but I know that you're working. I burned it. I'm living check to check, but God, I know you're working. Are you guys with me, church? You know, this is where we got to trust God's plan as the, as the, as the potters. Yeah. Is that God has a specific plan in mind for you. And if you complain, if you struggle, if you fight him back, then God can't accomplish it in your life. You're actually making it harder for yourself and longer for God to work on you. And then what happens on the line is you become bitter and angry at God. But God says, uh, I was working in you, but you stopped me. You withheld your heart from me. You closed down. God says, I can't work on a closed heart. You guys with me, church? And I'll, I'll finish with this verse so I can let my incredible brother Jerry and Jessica do the close. Verse 8 says, if that nation 
I warn repent of all its evil, then I will relent and not inflict on its disaster I had planned. Don't you realize that God's looking at you? It's just a decision to repent, to acknowledge your sinful nature and say, God, you know, I tanked it. I dropped the ball. I'm sorry. I'm going to get right with you. And God says, I had an army coming your way, but I stopped them. God is literally telling the Israelites, although your generations all have sinned, but if one person stands his ground and says, God, I will make it right, then God says, I will relent my punishments. What a God. God says, if you take ownership of your actions, then I will relent it. Yeah. Are you guys with me, church? Yeah. So let us be good clay, amen? amen? Let God shape you, mold you, and make you into a beautiful pot. Don't, don't be shaking and moving. You're going to be all cranky, looking all weird in the pot. You're going to make it, but you're going to be looking weird. Amen? Well, I love you, family. To God be the glory, I hand it over to Jessica. And...